another thing I want to say is that there were groups that maybe didn't approach the music with this idea in mind, but hit on certain things I mentioned earlier. That when I mentioned that um, Darius Milo was a composer who was um, a classical composer who was jazz influenced, well, a student of his was a man named Dave Brubeck, and before Dave Brubeck had the quartet, he actually had an experimental octet, which was a very, very um, um, group ahead of its time, if anybody checks the octet out. Of course, it's not anywhere near as commercially known as the quartet, but the octet was a very, very hardcore group, and it's definitely worth checking out. And um, Cecil Taylor, in fact, checked out the um, octet very closely, and you can hear that in some very early Cecil Taylor music. Cecil Taylor is another person whose name comes up mainly because he was a pianist and he had some classical training. But he never approached music. I mean, if, if you ever really get Cecil Taylor to talk about his early impulse, he always tries to emph emphasize, you know, the idea of Monk and Horace Silver over those influences that might seem more classical oriented. But I guess playing the piano, you cannot escape. It's, or it's difficult to escape classical influences of some sort because the classical music has such an all-encompassing um, influence on how the piano is perceived. And in fact, you know, somebody like Art Tatum, you know, has classical influences, even though I have no idea how much, I mean, Art Tatum is, is a natural synthesizer just by virtue of his talent and by virtue of the fact that he was extremely open player so everything kind of goes through his subconscious mind and gets funneled into his pianistic language how much of it was actual and ever conscious attempt to take things from classical music and, and diffuse it in nobody knows because nobody knows what he practiced or how he actually approached things but um all of that is to say that the piano naturally lends itself to um to sonorities and things that do come from classical music. A, a group, another group that really had a lot of um, the sonority of classical music entered their language, even though it was a very jazz-oriented group, was the Jimmy Jufri Three, which was a group that um, was around in the early 60s. Paul Blay was the pianist. A young Steve Swallow was a 19-year-old bass player and he was playing upright acoustic bass at the time, and Jimmy Jufri was playing clarinet and, the, and a composer. And he was in and around um, Gunther and all these people that were kind of the major um, figures in the third stream of music. Now, Jimmy Jufri is never accredited as being a part of that movement and in on the um, theoretizing and creation of whatever it was that allowed that movement to flourish. But that group, the Jimmy Jufri Three, embodies the complete and utter spirit of it. And in fact, if you listen to the group, it, it's, to me, a quintessential third stream type of ensemble in how they use kind of a chamber music texture. But the improvisation being explored is jazz improvisation. But the texture, you know, because it's a drummerless group and most of the concerts you hear, are kind of in concert halls and they have that chamber music concert hall type sound and you have a clarinet with a piano with an upright bass. It's, it's a very third stream type of group and that's a group that was ahead of its time, never really got its due. But they, they are recorded. Um, the Brahmin concerts was one album, there's a few other and it's definitely a group that's ahead of its time and I don't even know if people have caught up to it yet. Anyway, Mr. Bissio, do you have anything to well, add? Well, my composition teacher was Bill William O. Smith, who also studied with Mio, and in fact was the clarinetist in the Dave Brubeck Octet, and he and Dave were lifetime friends. And Bill, like both these guys have mentioned, Bill always imparted a certain vitality in music, no matter what you were playing, no matter how it crossed, he still, I saw him in February, he's 90 years old, he's indestructible, just his life force is incredible. And only about six years ago, 
he came to New York with a, a chamber opera he had just written. It's called uh, Places in the Heart, or no, Space in the Heart. And it uh, was an opera about the woman astronaut who put on a diaper and drove across the country to kill her, her lover's rival. <laughs> I mean, this is just, I mean, I mean, the man was like 84 years old then, had just broke, broken his leg. He lost his b beret. He's known for always wearing a beret. So every lunchtime, he wanted me to take him out to go buy a beret. But he was walking like this, and we wouldn't even make it to the corner and lunch would be over. So finally, one day, I, one night, I went out and bought him a, a beret. But it's just, it's a very special, um, thing when you're around people who originated this because there weren't the barriers that there are today. You know, for instance, it would never have occurred to them to come up with a term like non-idiomatic improvisation. There's just a whole movement that we've lost a certain part of it with the individual um, idioms that have certain boundaries that only certain people can cross. And I think there's a real need in, to have a language that is your own and that, is, that you're saying something with. And to me, if you're going to call something non-idiomatic, it's just there's, like, there's no language. And all, all the originators of this, I think, had a very specific drive and a very specific life force. And that's um, what should be carried on. One other thing I want to add when you look at the quote movement that's defined as third stream music, there's an inevitability about it. Um, it's something that almost had to have happened. And that, that doesn't matter if you look at it as a movement that was consciously started, that it, you know, there's some great things that happened, there might have been some failures, but that, none of that matters. There, the, the, there is an inevitability to it, and it kind of positions itself between a lot of things. I mean, it, it situates itself between um, straight ahead jazz, free jazz, classical music, and it kind of provides a form for people to get together and exchange ideas. And that's kind of the major aspect is just to get together and try things. And, you know, there's no ever any harm in trying things. There's never any harm in being open-minded to influences. There's never any, um, anything wrong with understanding that language is language and you melt it down and you try to find the essence of like why a musical idea is a musical idea whether it's you know what it doesn't matter what the clothes you put on it it's the body underneath the idea so you can change the clothes you can call it jazz you can call it classical and I'm not denying that you know there's a jazz idiom and there's a classical idiom and they have you know, very specific things that allow them to be what they are. I, I'm just saying that musicians getting together with an open mind and trying out various things is kind of what it's about. That, to me, is the inevitability of the third string music. Now, another thing, I mean, Gunther Schuller, all the people involved with it were very, very big fans of Charles Mingus also, and they would, I think they would have acknowledged that there were some suites of Mingus's and some of his works that naturally gravitated towards this idea without ever trying to do it. And in fact, for instance, on the Town Hall concert, if you listen to Jackie Byard's long piano interlude on that, that to me is, that piano interlude is everything Third Stream is about in a nutshell, and he wasn't trying to be third stream, he was just being Jackie Byard there. Um, and, con and incidentally, Jackie Byard was around Boston in this whole fervor of activity that we've been talking about. So he, I mean, you know, all these ideas were swirling around and, and he was around all that. It's not a sense of fusion of music, but it's a real absorption of different stylistic things and then making it your own right. and then translating it through your own voice. I think that's very important where it wasn't like I'm going to like check out some Indian classical music and then mix it with like some kind of prog rock thing and then put it together and it's going to be third street. I don't think that's what it was about. It's really kind of checking out your environment, checking out what people are doing and in the 20th century this became inevitable like you said with the internet and this and but just the melting pot of New York and everything. 
uh, eventually people are going to be hearing this kind of music, that kind of music. The more you understand it, the more you internalize it. And it wasn't like my father was trying to say like, oh, I have this Greek melody, but I know this Schoenberg 12-tone row, and I want to like kind of mix the two and, and you know, it'll play in 7-8 and it'll be cool. He did that a little bit, but it was like, no, that wasn't so effective as really absorbing this kind of community of vibrant music, people playing something with passion and then incorporating it in his own vibrant way. And I think that's the key. Well, I knew your father. Yeah. And can I say, he was way too insane to ever have been contrived <laughs> in the way you described. Like, yeah. like, possibly he was way too insane. <laughs> no, but he was extremely he passionate. Was, he was very passionate. <laughs> I mean, but like, at the same time, I mean, Gunther Schuller got him the job at any New England Conservatory of Music. So like, he was kind of brought in this fold of this third stream idea in a way. Right. Even though he's in the classical department, he was dealing with all the improvisers. He right, loved right. the improvisers, even though he's teaching theory and harmony in the Schoenberg, blah, blah, blah. Uh, his whole thing was like, can you improvise? Can we do something with this? Can we you know, expand our horizons? And that was right. exciting.